Hi, uh, this is the Jashu, and uh, this is a long time after we have uh, had a very essential video, a learning video from uh, the Jashu's world, of course. And uh, it has been a long time that I've been able to post any kind of video into uh, my website and my web and my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm really sorry for that because I've been really busy into some other kind of works. Anyways, keeping all those things aside, I would like to say that uh, today I am just going to introduce you to a very um, basic uh, level of uh, of the of the of the embedded world. And uh, as I promised you, that I will definitely guide you through to a project, that real life project, which you can which you can really sell. You can you can really put up to some science exhibition, or or you can really uh, you know you can you can just kickstart your corporate project with that so the first thing that we should remember is uh, is, is that uh, when we are going to start our journey with the microcontrollers or the embedded world uh, keeping aside the general SVCs that the single board computers or the or the RTOS that's the real-time operating system based uh, devices I'm not going to cover that that area right now and I don't have any plans to put up RTOS or or SVCs in my in my website but uh, as far as microcontrollers are concerned uh, what I would first like to say is that you know um, whatever I have covered in my previous videos they were very basic I just covered numbered system my first video, I'm sorry. My first video was on basically on uh, on what an embedded system is, how important it is in your in your in your curriculum, and how you should go through it. And after that, I just uh, got I, I just made a video I think on number conversions. And after that, I made a video on uh, uh, on IC C communication, I or I I C or T W I communication between two chips or a master and a slave that's a serial communication a synchronous serial communication and I should have maybe covered a few more topics like UART uh, uh, spy uh, this um, SPI communication and uh, you know GSM communication GPS uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth and even connectivity to the iOS cloud maybe some kind of uh, of, of uh, cloud hosting like Windows Azure or, or maybe Amazon or, or or a lot of you know things big or or a lot of free free IoT platforms that you have but okay keeping all those things aside we'll do all of them never worry let us just first understand what a microcontroller is because if you do not understand what a microcontroller is you're not going to be able to send any kind of data to any cloud and you know sending data to any cloud is not a big deal with the kind of modules that are available today and the in the APIs that they have you just gonna send some 80 commands and okay I'll tell you what an 80 command is we'll go through it when we when we will be doing the, the uh, in the interfacing of uh, sim 900 modules so uh, it's not it's not like it's not uh, basically it's not uh, you know robot science so or maybe rocket science so the first thing that you should understand is uh, you must have a few things in your mind the first thing is that uh, whatever you do you're going to revise you have to have the documents that I say or that I put up in my videos and uh, these particular documents or exercises you must have with with you and you must revise them and you must have a passion for learning microcontroller because it's going to be boring trust me it's going to be boring at some times I'm not joking with you it's a kind of a deal <laughs> that I have to make and uh, yeah it it is it is interesting at times to add also you know when you when you really find something you know you expect it to happen in a code and it really happens and you really get the data across maybe you're sending some data from your 
from a device and it gets and it gets reflected somewhere else in an LCD or you get some data in your mobile phone which you're sending from your circuit it does make you happy right or maybe you're controlling your your light of your home uh, through your PC so all these kind of applications will make you excited but at the base of all these lies the big heart of the thing that is called the microcontroller so the micro so the, so the microcontroller that I will be using uh, is nothing but what we call as MSP 430 right now why the name MSP 430 uh, few people say that MSP 430 is a family of microcontrollers that were introduced by uh, Texas Instruments long time back and uh, it was on on uh, 30th of April so that's the reason why they have given the name the number uh, 430 and the 430 is for 30th of April so that's the number convention and uh, this MSP part this MSP part it stands for mixed signal processing means uh, this microcontroller basically can handle mixed signals that is what do you mean by mixed signals it means that it can it can handle both analog as well as digital signals so your microcontroller will be able to handle analog signals that is you will have an analog comparator inside you can you can you can you can uh, you can have conditions where where you can use an analog comparator you don't need an op amp for that and you can have differential amplifiers and and, and other kind of instrumentation amplifiers and and other op amp devices inside your 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 microcontroller and uh, as well as that you can have digital systems so it's a mixed signal processor so that explains why we call it or rather we, uh, why uh, TI calls it as a mixed signal processor so that's mixed signal processor developed or introduced on 30th of April so that gives the MSC 430 now comes a strange part that is X to XX this is very important for you to know because uh, when you will be selecting a microcontroller for your own project you must understand that why the X to XX is coming into the picture right so I'll just go I'll just give you a very basic and brief introduction to why uh, this X to XX is coming into picture this X is nothing but the family right so if you really go to ti.com I'll show you over here how to do it when you're going to just ti.com and if you have a check on the product line in the product line they will have uh, micro microcontrollers and in their microcontroller systems if you see uh, there are a lot of microcontrollers they have they have a series or a bulk of microcontrollers you know like Texas Instruments is the company or the organization who really work hard for developing 16-bit and 32-bit microcontrollers they don't have any kind of 8-bit the only 8-bit microcontroller family or the flavor that you can have is I think uh, some CC wi wireless enabled microcontroller 2538 where you have a wireless front end and an 8-bit 8051 core but other than that there are no other 8-bit microcontrollers there are all 16-bit and 32-bit microcontrollers and the one that we are going to work on is a 16-bit microcontroller right so under the microcontrollers you can have in the product tree you will see that is over here you will see that you know there are various kinds of microcontrollers one is simple link right uh, the simple link MCUs are basically wireless communication enabled MCUs the simple link is nothing but a OS or an RTOS developed by TI it is totally loyalty loyalty free that is royal that is you don't have to pay for for developing any kind of commercial devices uh, right but if you are if you are developing any kind of Bluetooth system 
then you obviously have to get certify your your, your particular device for the Bluetooth uh, certification but uh, as of my information goes is for certain kind of devices uh, you can use Texas Instruments Bluetooth vendor ID and product ID so that's the simple link processors which are Wi-Fi enabled and net ne network enabled processors then you come down you have MSP430 ultra low power MCUs that is where we are concentrating that is MCU ultra low power so under MCU ultra low power if you click over here okay before clicking let me tell you you have a value line MCU that is 13 number of quantities you have capacitive sensing MCUs that is 6 number of quantities you have ultrasonic and performance sensing MCUs that is 98 person 98 quantities and other MSP 430 MCUs that is 422 so let me go into all the 430 MCUs and you can have the product list over here what I want to tell you is that you know you will have to understand that uh, the MSP 430 family they have various types of chips right so what can what are the type of chips that you have you can find it over here you have a 2x6 family you have a 5x6 family you have a 6x6 family now what are these families meant for you know why would you why would you rather um, choose for a microcontroller that is uh, 2xx family which belongs to 2xx family uh, another one where why would you choose for a microcontroller that belongs to 4xx family or 5xx or 6xx so there are many reasons for that for 2xx family they are only the basic microcontrollers right which we are going to use there are two flavors for that one is the F series. I just try to um, Okay, so here they haven't given any kind of uh, differentiation. Okay, so uh, here again we can see that uh, the microcontroller that we are going to use is is here, and uh, the family which we are going to use is MSP 430 G2553. So here again, I would like to tell you that MSP 430 is okay. That I have already told you. G stands for value line series. Value line series means they have a mixture of all the peripherals that are required for for a very basic development and apart from that they cost 
very low right now one thing you must keep in mind that you are developing a system that is based on a SRAM and a flash type of a memory system well what does that mean you know every every microcontroller has an internal structure where or an internal memory uh, one is a kind of memory where your program gets downloaded that's called the ROM or the flash and the other part of the memory is called the SRAM or the RAM where where the random data are stored so it's a kind of you know it's a kind of uh, question paper in an examination which you get that is the ROM or the flash and your scratch pad or your answer script is like the RAM so once the, once the answer script is washed or is taken away it doesn't have any value but the question paper will remain printed even if it is you know kept away from you so the flash has the program now these G devices they have a fixed RAM okay and it depends from it varies from device to device some devices they have a higher value of RAM some devices they have a lower value of RAM recently my recently Texas Instruments have introduced something that is called an FRAM technology that is ferroelectric uh, random access memory which basically uses the ferroelectric property of iron and the dynamicity or the dynamicness of these kind of uh, memory is that you know you don't have a segregated or fixed area of flash where you can download your code and you don't have a fixed area of RAM which some part of which might get or remain unused you know most of you people who have already developed some kind of system in microcontrollers must have faced this problem of stack overflow you know you you, you you keep on popping you keep on popping you know you keep on uh, calling subroutines or interrupts and you know multiple interrupt nested vector interrupts and your stack keeps on growing and your stack size is just to not too much you know to help you out of your program so what you do is you reduce the number of callings or you you do you know you you disable interrupts while entering one interrupt you don't prioritize them so here you don't have to worry in the FRAM kind of processors what they do is if your program code is small you, you can you can dynamically allocate the RAM as more or of a greater space than the RAM sorry I'm sorry you can you can you can uh, you can you can increase the space of the RAM more than that of the ROM or the flash because it's an FRAM so you can you can dynamically allocate the boundary so if you need more RAM you can allocate if you need less RAM more code you can reallocate so that is the kind of technology that FRAM uses and you know all almost that's the reason why uh, you we were seeing that almost all the products they are FR so so the microcontrollers of the MSP430 series who have a numbering like MSP430 FR something something means that it depends or its memory is of FR type so I won't go into detail of this of this of this particular processor right now just uh, have an overlook of the processor we are going to use this microcontroller uh, for our particular project this is uh, not the actual uh, package which we are going to use we are going to use the PDIP package you will see over here we are going to use the PDIP package that is this one this one right and the biggest uh, part the biggest uh, help that that Texas instrument gives is that you know you don't have to buy these kind of products for your development you can just simply request sample from here you know your request sample is over here and you can just uh, request for a sample if TI agrees to you to your terms and conditions and if Texas Instruments feels that yeah you know giving you a sample is worth it then you can obviously go for it otherwise um, otherwise you can have a lot of uh, channel partners who can sell you uh, these ICs and they don't cost much right so going back to our topic this X part is now explained so now coming to the two 
the two family is for the basic family three is not there or I haven't seen or I have not worked with the, with the three family four is a much higher version that is you know you have a greater number of peripherals you have a greater number of pin count the number of ports are much bigger the memory size is greater and they are usually meant for systems which are of you know which require a great or more code size and the RAM size the 5 series has the same feature the same facilities but with additional uh, features like you know you have uh, you have USB connectivity USB HID uh, HID uh, specifications and um, the architecture is much more advanced the 6 family has direct the one advantage that the 6 family has is that you can directly interface LCD segments to the microcontroller you don't need any kind of you any kind of LCD controller in between the microcontroller and the LCD segments so <coughs> we will start off basically with the 2xx family now reading the user guide is very essential so please don't don't ignore the user guide it is very simple to download the user guide you can find it in my website it's there it's I have given the link it's given directly from TI you can download and make sure that you have the latest version that is SLAU uh, 144i that is the January 2012 version right so now let me go to the introduction so first comes the architecture the architecture you know like every particular microcontroller architecture has the same thing you know I'll just go through very briefly because these are very boring things I don't want to make you uh, go into all these kind of details because that is your work to do you're going to download this if you need take a printout and it's it's your job to go through each and every detail of the architecture the thing that I will highlight for you is that number one it's a 16-bit RISC CPU what does that what does that that mean it means that it can handle both 8-bit and 16-bit instructions so for people who have been working on Atmega or AVR or 8051 or PIC microcontrollers 8-bit PIC microcontrollers PIC also has 16-bit and 32-bit so uh, you always had to write 8-bit instructions right so here two 8-bit instructions are executed in a common cycle so that's one big thing you have a von Neumann architecture that is common memory address bus and memory data bus so you can see over here in this diagram right that there is one bus that is for address and there is one bus for data but the 16-bit address bus also shares the data bus so the main point is that it's a shared bus so that is one important feature that you should note another important feature is that if you are making any kind of application which is battery operated like for those guys who are into uh, low voltage electronics you know many people prefer making circuits for low voltage devices like uh, you know uh, portable devices especially or handheld devices they must go for this kind of family because if you put the device to a sleep mode or an, or an LPM or low power mode I'll tell you what a low power mode is then the chip or the microcontroller derives only 0.1 microampere that is only for RAM retention that is only for saving the values inside the RAM okay so only 0.1 microampere current is required or is drained from the battery to retain the RAM the entire processor goes to sleep now what is LPM LPM is low power mode these MSPs they have five low power modes LPM 0 1 2 3 4 okay so in LPM 0 some part of the chip is disabled 
in LPM1 some more part of the chip is disabled in LPM2 some more part is disabled so like this you know step by step you can put the several parts of the microcontroller to sleep so what happens is that ultimately the current withdrawing from the battery reduces the next one you can see is 0.8 microampere real-time clock mode so if you want a real-time clock there's an RTC in built in your in your microcontroller you don't have to buy the the, uh, the RTCs separately so if you want the RTC to, to carry on or a tick SysTick or a system clock to run then the current withdrawing becomes a slight higher it becomes 0.8 that's almost eight times and when the controller is working in full working mode then it is 250 microamperes per mega instructions per second that's the active mode as they've written right so that that is very important you must remember it is definitely a high performance analog ideal for precision measurements because you have a comparator gated timers that is as I told you you have a com comparator directly inside the processor so it has a high performance precision measurement you can very precisely measure uh, you know values specifically for instrumentation users where you want to measure the error between the set point and the process variable this is the device for you so you can use it for those kind of applications uh, you have okay I'll just basically describe this particular uh, this particular uh, photo or the system architecture that is this is your CPU 16-bit RISC CPU right this is your JTAG now what is JTAG JTAG is nothing but you know it's a connection between your computer and the debugger and the microcontroller so basically to access what is going on inside your microcontroller you need something that's called a JTAG I'm not going to going into much details of JTAG as of now just remember that JTAG is a device or a small circuit that is built inside the launch pad circuit that helps the, con the computer read what is actually going inside your microcontroller so the, the, the JTAG or debugging port is connected directly to the RISC CPU and also the other peripherals now here one thing you must remember there are two type of peripherals that you will have in this particular processor one is the 8-bit peripheral and the other is a 16-bit peripheral the 8-bit peripheral and uh, yeah one thing one another thing that you must know is that you know some peripherals are memory mapped I mean sorry all the peripherals are memory mapped so some 8-bit peripherals their memory location or the access location is located at a specific area of the memory map for example if you need to access a timer and if it is an 8-bit timer or it is an 8-bit or it has an 8-bit access mode it will be located or the, the the access register will be located in the 8-bit peripheral region I'll show you in the map in the memory map later on and there are also 16-bit peripherals whose location whose register control register locations are separately located in a different part of the memory map I hope you can understand and this is the flash or ROM as I was talking about this is the RAM okay and this is the watchdog timer this is very important because your if your code is not running properly then the watchdog is the thing that will save you it will be a savior and there are the peripherals are all scattered they have there is an I squared C peripheral there is a new RT peripheral there is a micro DMA there are timers there are two type of timers there is OC, USCI, UCA, OCB uh, OCA and B they can operate in different modes they can operate for UART mode they can operate for SPI mode they can operate for I2C mode all those details we will, will go into it 
later on but these peripherals are all connected with them with the main processor right now one thing I need to highlight is that the clocking system you know this MSP 430 has a very interesting clocking system MSP 430 has a very interesting clocking system what is it you know there are multiple areas or multiple sources of clocking the 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 heart of the processor the first is the very low frequency processor the very low frequency clock which is operated by a simple RC that is a resistor and a capacitor the one that we use to see in the multi 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 vibrators in in the 555 timer so you can use that and that that RC oscillator is not at all accurate but you don't need to be because RC oscillator is only used when the processor is in deep sleep mode and it only needs to wake up when there is an interrupt so that is very low clock they call it VLOCLK or very low clock next I come to LFXT1 CLK that is low frequency clock this low frequency clock can be operated using 32.7 kilohertz uh, clock crystal the one that we get the small ones or you can also use a proper 16 up to 16 megahertz crystal so this LFXT1 CLK mode or the module can operate at higher frequency mode and at a lower frequency mode all these configurations needs to be done using the registers which I will cover up in the next session because uh, first I want to give you the overview and then I will go into configuration right then there is the then the, then there is the XT2 clock system that is more high frequency clock system so XT2 clock system is totally dependent on external clock system you can connect directly uh, either an external clock frequency or you can you can connect a crystal directly to the XT2 and the fourth most important clock clocking that this processor has is the DCO that is the DC controlled oscillator the beauty of the DC controlled oscillator is whenever this chip or the microcontroller powers on it powers on from the DCO and this DCO has needs only one to two microseconds to stabilize and that is beautiful it's beautiful it's 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 really beautiful so you don't have to worry if your crystal is bad because what it does is the whenever you switch on the microcontroller you know there's a there's a there, there's a voltage supervisor who supervises the vol the the voltage or the supply voltage and whenever the supply voltage goes above a particular level it automatically switches the core or the microcontroller core to be operated from the DCO the DCO by default is running at 1 megahertz right so your microcontroller gets up and running at 1 megahertz core speed and you don't have to bother whether your external crystal is bad or is at fault and this problem happens with many microcontrollers who directly try to uh, operate externally from external micro from from external crystals so once your processor is on the DCO the DCO has stabilized and your processor is running at DCO you can configure the DCO right you can configure the TCO to other frequencies right I'll tell you how okay the default frequency is 1 megahertz the core starts at 1 megahertz and it will always start from and it will always start from DCO because the DCO is the most reliable DC control oscillator is the most reliable source for the for the clocking system of the microcontroller to operate if the DCO doesn't operate then your core will not start up but it doesn't happen so once the DCO settles and your core is operating what you have what you have some steps to operate you have to, you have some steps to write you have some code to write in order to switch 
the clocking system for the main controller to your external crystal in case suppose if you're using an external if you are using the DCO for your project you don't have to bother anything but if you're using an external crystal then you have to write a part of the code which will which will swap the clock source to the external crystal whether it is LFXT1 CLK or it is XT2 and that's a small part of the code that you have to write now say for example if if your crystal is bad is not working the core switches to to the external crystal and it sees that there is some fault with the external crystal there's a beauty in this processor it will automatically generate a flag which will identify the oscillator fault and your processor will swap back to the DCO it will not stop functioning right it will swap back to the DCO it will set the oscillator flag and if you have an interrupt enabled or if you have an interrupt flag enabled for any kind of oscillator falls then the processor immediately goes to a non maskable interrupt or such an interrupt which you cannot mask or you cannot stop from going into sometimes this is very helpful because there are very mission critical applications or slightly critical applications where you know where visiting to the site is very difficult so if your crystal is damaged you have a, you you have, you have written a code to swap to the external crystal and the crystal is damaged so the core tries to operate from the external crystal it starts it, it starts from the DCO it swaps to the external crystal and it sees that the crystal is not operating so it so it raises the oscillator flag and after raising the oscillator flag if if the if the interrupt is if the oscillator fault interrupt is enabled the the processor will go to the interrupt subroutine for the oscillator fault and in that oscillator fault subroutine you can log some kind of data or some kind of information which will help you know that the oscillator is at fault but one thing you have to remember that you have to clear the flag once entering the subroutine otherwise it will keep on interrupting so once the NMI is, is executed you've logged the information that the external crystal is at fault the processor will come back it will continue working it will continue working using the DCO and when you have repaired or you know you have replaced your your external crystal you can just give the processor a restart and the processor will again start operating from your external crystal so that's the beauty that we have and there are three different clock systems that is ACLK that is the auxiliary clock auxiliary clock is mainly used in the sleep modes when the processor is in sleep mode the auxiliary clock is used you have a sub main clock the sub main clock is mainly used for supplying the clock to the peripherals and other parts of the system and you have the MCLK which is the main clock or the master clock which 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 supplies the the digital clocking to the CPU so I feel that you know you are more or less clear with the architecture of the MSP430 uh, 2xx series G2xx series you just have to go through these uh, you know these uh, headings everything's written over here one more important thing is the memory map right so the memory map you can see that it's a 16-bit address map so um, you can you know this part up till this part up till this part I'm, I'm explaining I'm not explaining the upper part because that is not applicable for all the devices let's start from here from 0 hex to 0 fx that is a total of 16 bytes right a 16 bytes 
you have a special function registers these registers are registers which are required for configuring the clock system the basic system the critical system for this microcontroller after that this area this area is, is, is responsible or they have the registers which are required for configuring the 8-bit peripherals I'll go into the 8-bit peripheral details when I will be discussing all the peripherals and I will relate back to this diagram each and every time so you don't have to worry and you know like don't mug up all these details because you don't have to mug up just just keep on going through just read through just understand you don't have to mug up these addresses because these addresses this is a user user family user guide not all the processors will have the same address map and not all the processors will have the same peripherals discussed over here then there is a 16 bit peripheral module that is uh, this part of the memory map that is from 01002 1ff x this part of the memory map is stored or the registers over here if you calculate there are 256 registers over here so 256 bytes or 256 registers registers are stored for your 16 bit peripheral modules now starts the ram you can see the ram start is from 0200 hex that is this one but there is an arrow over here what does it mean that means that the ram how much ram there will be depends on the device that is it, it it varies from device to device also one more thing that you need to know is the 8-bit peripheral modules they have a byte mode access obviously it has to be because you can only access 8 bits at a time but the 16-bit peripheral modules they have a word mode access that is you can directly write 16 bits over there so you can really you know declare a variable called unsigned short and you can directly write that uns unsigned short to a register over here whereas if you do the same thing in the 8-bit peripheral module part the upper part or the upper 8 bits will be truncated by the compiler so that is that is what you have to keep in mind and the RAM is word and word as well as byte compatible so you can write both 16-bit as well as 8-bit next I come to the flash and ROM the flash and ROM is again the variable sign is here as you can see means that the end part of the flash and ROM is FFDFX but from where it start it again depends or varies from device to device finally let me come to the interrupt vector table the interrupt vector table starts from FFE0 and it goes to FFFX now interrupt vector table is very interesting I must go to the interrupt vector table once to make you understand that how it functions yeah here it is see the last part you know I told you that interrupt vector table is word access enable that is you have two bytes you have you have a 16-bit address right so FFFE and FFFF these two locations this is the address part but the data part which actually contains the address of the program where the processor should run to right that that is 16 bit so you need two locations to point to that so FFFE hex and FFFF hex together that is FFFE hex is a 8 bit you know this is the word address I hope you can understand this is a word address but word address is like the address of your building but how much how many bits of data your building can store only 8 bits so you need two such addresses that is FFF E and FFF F hex together 8 bits and 8 bits make 16 bit address and this 16 bit address is the address from where the processor will start working whenever there is a power up condition 
So whenever the processor is powered up, it comes to FFFE and FFFF hex location. And that's the reason why it has the highest priority. So the, so the reset will always, or power up condition will always have a highest priority. Next you can see that there is a NMI. NMI is nothing but NMI is nothing but the non-maskable interrupt which comes for an oscillator fault right so whenever there's an oscillator fault and if the interrupt is enabled as I told you the processor will jump to FFFC hex and also FFFD hex because both of them together will form a 16-bit address where the processor will jump so these are all the addresses you know you'll see device specific device specific device specific written over here because you know these are all you know these are all uh, interrupt locations for various kind of peripheral modules it is not possible to specify which address belongs to which peripheral in the general user guide I'll go through this when I will be discussing the the interrupt table for the particular microcontrol that we that we will be using but to start off uh, after the architecture more or less you are accustomed with the architecture of this particular processor you are accustomed with how the functioning of the startup occurs and you are also accustomed with the clocking system so now the first thing that we must learn learn is the system reset and the clocking so the chapter one that we will cover is obviously the chapter one that we will cover is obviously the basic clock module okay so the next in the next class or in the next session I will be covering basic clock module because without understanding how the clocking operates you will not be able to power on the MCU and unless and until you power on the MCU there's no point discussing anything regarding that okay so thank you for listening to my channel I hope this has helped you a lot and keep on studying download this data sheet I told you uh, go through this go through chapter number uh, one that is the introduction and the architecture if you want you can go ahead but I would suggest you not to just try to understand keep your brain cool and uh, follow my channel and if you like it do share it because there are many people who would like to uh, you know uh, who would like to start the design of the Texas instrument platform and for people who are working on Arduino let me tell you you have great fun because Arduino is giving you ready-made libraries but that's the worst thing that's happening to you you don't know what is going on inside you don't understand in depth and as Tejas has uh, has uh, you know like uh, commented on my video that I should start writing the code and there are maybe there are some minor faults in my in my teaching in my in my learning sessions so I I do apologize for the kind of falls that I've made there might be some errors so please let me know if there are kind of errors in the website you have the comment section do comment on 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 the video I'll try to correct the error and re upload a correct video and uh, thank you Tejas for watching my youtube channel and uh, you must you know you must have the dedication in you that you want to build the system the remote controlled uh, the, re the remote control switchboard that I have shown you that I had shown you and we will be able to do it once we start learning the microcontroller which is very important so bye bye good night and I don't know from which part of the world you're seeing so maybe good night is not applicable for you so do it study and try to understand and for any queries you have my email address to joshu at the joshu's world dot in do put in some mails you can directly comment on my website you can comment on the youtube channel i can i can reply i can put up a one thing more i can do is you, if you have a very complicated query
do put up the question and I will explain your query and I will repost the video I have already told you about that I know I'm a bit late you know in posting videos because I have a lot of work to do so I'm sorry for that but I'll do it for sure so for now guys bye bye take care do study and we'll start off from chapter 5 where we will be learning the entire clocking module configuration including the registers and we will do the lab where we will test it okay bye bye